Hey guys, so I am talking about a video called Vegan for 30 Days, What They Don't Tell You. This is by YouTuber Catherout. Uh, this was shared by a patron. Going by the title, I mean, what they don't tell you, it sounds like, oh, it's gonna be not so great maybe, right? Actually, I think it is overall a very good video. I think it's something that's good for people who are new to veganism, people who are considering going vegan, and also people who have been vegan for a long time, especially if you are advocating for veganism, because she talks about a lot of the pitfalls that she experienced, which I think are very common. So socializing, you know, it's something you hear about a lot from pretty much any person who has ever gone vegan or tried to go vegan. It's socializing can be really tough. So she talks about going out with friends and having to dictate where they are going to eat to make sure that it's some place that has an option for her. I think she said she's been vegan for like a year, year and a half, a vegetarian. And she talked about how when you're vegetarian, it's a lot easier because most places have at least like one vegetarian option. But when you're vegan, it can be a lot harder. So she was kind of frustrated by having to constantly <laughs> dictate where they had to go eat. Hey, let's go to this Thai place because I know they have something vegan for me. And she talked about some positives that she experienced as well. Again, something that I think a lot of people would experience. Basically that going vegan forces you to learn a lot about food because you are looking at labels. You are learning about what is in food. She talked about how surprised she was that animal products are in so many things. If you're vegan, you've had that experience before just being like, what, why? Why is there milk in this? And this can often lead to us being healthier, right? The more effort you put into your food, the more you think about your food, probably the more healthy you're going, you're going to be most of the time. Obviously you can eat a vegan diet and still be pretty unhealthy. So yeah, highly, highly recommend watching it. It's not very long. I think it's like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, not super duper long, but there are a couple of things that I wanted to talk about in this video. Some things that are, uh, a little bit wrong, or maybe I have a little bit of a different perspective on. And I know the ideal version of veganism is not even trying to eat the substitutes, like not eating fake meat, not eating fake cheeses. So I'm not sure what she means by ideal, but I'm assuming she means in terms of health. So from like a health standpoint, so that it would be better to eat a totally whole food vegan diet that doesn't include any meat or dairy alternatives. I think it depends. I think it's a little more nuanced than that. So obviously we can look at foods like the vegan cheeses. 90% of those are like coconut oil, palm oil, salt, <laughs> right? Like that's all it is. It's obviously a junk food. Also with the, the butter alternatives, right? The earth balance, even my beloved Miyoko's is junk food. And then on the kind of other end of the spectrum, I think you have something like dairy alternatives when it comes to milk, something like a fortified soy milk, that is a healthy food. And it's something that's necessary for many vegans to make sure that we get enough calcium. And then somewhere in the middle, I think you would have mock meats. Obviously there are other you know foods as well, but I guess those are the main three. So somewhere in the middle, you would have something like mock meats, which again, it depends. You know, t to me, there's a big difference between something like the Beyond Meat griller strips and like some of the, the crispy tenders, right? Like the fake chicken that's still breaded and fried. Like I would consider that, ugh, like that's pretty junky, right? But the, the griller strips, the Beyond Meat griller strips, that then you're gonna put in what? I don't know, I mean, you can make like a really delicious stir fry with that, with vegetables. That's pretty healthy to me. Yeah, he's totally using the blender. I think he thinks that's quiet. It's not. And mock meats can also be a good source of nutrition, a good source of protein, a good source of other nutrients like iron and zinc. Obviously beans are better <laughs> and fiber is really important, of course, but there are people who really struggle being vegan because of the amount of fiber in a typical vegan diet, a more whole, you know, plant-based, vegan diet. And so mock meats can be really, really helpful. Jack Norris actually shared this really interesting anecdote uh, from a longtime vegan. And she talked about really struggling with the diet, not only from not supplementing, but she also talks about mock meats and how incorporating them have really helped her. And of course, these foods can really help people stay vegan, you know, not just the mock meats, but also the less healthy one, the cheeses and the Miyoko's butter and whatever else. It's really hard to eat unprocessed plants and only unprocessed plants, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, fruits and vegetables. That can be really, really difficult. And most people were just not totally interested in that.
So I would say that the ideal vegan diet is the vegan diet that you can stick with, that keeps you healthy, that keeps you vegan. There's also the argument that eating these products, these fake cheeses and fake meats, that this normalizes eating actual animal products. And so therefore, it's not vegan to eat Gardein, Beyond Meat, Tofurky, etc. Which I think, I think is really silly. There's no evidence for this sort of effect, this any sort of negative effect. On the other hand, there is evidence for positive effect. Obviously buying these products keeps them on the shelf. It shows that there is a market for them, which fuels investment into the sector, fuels innovation in the sector, a sector that competes with animal products. And again, these are foods that help many vegans stay vegan. I did do a lot of research about the environmental effects and I found that between vegan and vegetarian, it was like, a, mar a marginal difference and you can argue this on tons of fronts but from the research I did and the research I came to conclusion with um, there was a marginal difference so when we're talking about animal suffering it's said that going vegetarian does about 90% of the good of going vegan and that's probably pretty accurate due to the sheer amount of calories that a cow puts out per life when it comes to animal products, milk is one of the least of evils per calorie. But when we're talking about environmental impact, this is not true. So I don't know exactly where she got her information from. She said she did research and she came to the conclusion, again, that vegan is only marginally better. But I'm assuming that she probably got it from some of those slanted studies on carrying capacity. They basically favored vegetarian diets over vegan ones by assuming that much of the land used to feed cows would just be abandoned. So there are a few problems with this. Number one, we already produce enough grains to feed everybody if we just stop feeding them to animals. We don't need that extra land. We don't need to produce as much food as possible. We just need to feed the population and we can already do that. Saying that a vegetarian diet is the best for the world because of carrying capacity, it's like saying that a school bus is the best vehicle for a family of five because of carrying capacity. Second, there's no reason to believe that we couldn't use land that's currently growing fodder or used for grazing to grow other crops. And number three, these studies talk about land footprint, but they completely ignore global warming potential. Milk is relatively efficient in terms of protein per acre. It's similar to wheat. But in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, there's no comparison. Here's some info from the FAO on greenhouse gas emissions from dairy. Worldwide, it's 2.7% of emissions. That's a big deal considering that these are completely avoidable and it may even be worse in developed countries. For example, the United States produces 16% of the milk with only 4.6% of the population. Assuming that we're not exporting most of it, that's about 3.5 times the consumption versus the world average. The world average is 2.4 kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilogram of milk, versus the US at about 1.2. That's half the emissions per kilogram, but it doesn't make up for the increased consumption. So if you do the math, 2.7% times half of the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram times, again, 3.5 times more milk, you get 4.7% greenhouse gas emissions. If the total for animal agriculture is around 18%, then this is about 26% of the total. So obviously that was really crude, but this UK study did come to similar conclusions. 5.63 kilograms CO2 equivalent from diet per day for medium meat eaters, 3.81 for vegetarians, and 2.89 for vegans. So that's a difference of 2.74 between medium meat eaters and vegans, and 1.82 kilograms between meat eaters and vegetarians. Meaning that the vegetarians reduced about two thirds that of the vegans. So all that said, when we're talking about the environment, obviously going vegetarian, giving up meat is going to help out a lot. But if you are still consuming dairy, that benefit is going to be significantly limited. Now, if you are a vegetarian and also limiting dairy, like the vegetarians in the Adventist study, then obviously you are making a huge contribution. And then I think you can talk about veganism being only marginally better than that form of vegetarianism. Again, it really depends on what you're eating. If you are vegetarian, but like half or more of your calories are coming from dairy, is not so great. In fact, this study found that replacing meat with dairy may actually be worse in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So please don't be bought in, don't be confused by bad studies talking about something irrelevant like carrying capacity. The real problem is global warming and milk is by no means a marginal contributor 
when we're talking about global warming. Now eggs, they might actually be a marginal contributor in terms of global warming, but of course we can't forget about the immense amount of animal cruelty involved in producing them. Thank you so much. What's that? I'm saying hi, but no, it's the end. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, go watch Cather Out's video. I just wanted to comment on it because I think overall, again, it's a really good video and I like to, I guess, encourage people and just say, hey, thanks. Thanks for saying positive stuff about veganism. That was really cool. Um, and also it gave me a chance to talk about the carrying capacity stuff. I don't think that's something I talked about, I know some people have asked about that and uh, were a little bit worried about that. So hopefully that answered your questions there. Thanks so much for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Comments and questions, of course, if you want to subscribe, of course. And if you want to support the channel, of course, patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. Thank you again. And I will have a new video very soon. Ooh, I think partner's making yogurt. We're going to start making our own yogurt for baby. I think that's what's happening. I think he's blending. I think he's blending some almonds. Someone made that comment on uh, the what I ate today I did for baby that like we use a lot of plastic and stuff. There's a lot of waste involved in what we feed him. And yeah, it's totally true. The two big offenders are the yogurt, like half to one whole container a day. That at least can be recycled. The Gerbers cannot. And then the other thing is the little Gerber pear thing. And it's so silly because that's so easy to replace. Um, we just, it's just pear. It's literally pear and cinnamon and the infant cereal, which we can buy a huge thing of the infant cereal. It'll last much longer. And pear and cinnamon, I mean, it's not, you could just get canned pear, like it's not even hard. So we're starting with the yogurt, uh, which is actually a little bit harder, but uh, yeah, we, we got a slow cooker. We're actually gonna try it in a slow cooker because I wanted a slow cooker anyway, because I haven't had one in a while and I used to use one all the time. There's this slow cooker, vegan book. I forgot what it's called. I've mentioned it here before and I love it. I've made so many recipes from that thing. It's so, they're just so, so good. So yeah, I'm going to start making some more recipes with that. So I'm excited and now we can make yogurt with it. It's exciting. I like food.